Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are now going to begin the webinar regarding the new obligation FAQs for the state and local fiscal recovery funds uh, for tribal governments in two minutes. Uh, this is a reminder that the FAQs being discussed on this webinar can be found in section 17 of the SLFRF FAQs, uh, the link to which is in the chat. Uh, and also a reminder that this presentation will be recorded and posted to Treasury's website. Thanks all. We'll get started here very shortly. Hi, everyone. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and begin the webinar uh, over the new obligation FAQs for the state and local fiscal recovery funds for tribal uh, governments. I'm going to uh, pass it off to Treasurer Malerba for some opening uh, remarks. We kisk, niti we sangsquamatai motamhash. I am Chief Lynn Malerba of the Mohegan tribe. I said good day to everyone. Um, I am presently serving as a treasurer, and I'm very happy to join you today for this webinar. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, the state and local fiscal recovery funds provided an unprecedented $20 billion set aside for tribal governments. And this truly was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And it provided you know, much needed capital um, to not only recover from the pandemic, but for tribes to address longstanding infrastructure needs. And I've been privileged to travel about throughout Indian country to see some of the projects that tribes have been embarked upon. Uh, and it's just been remarkable um, how tribes have embraced this opportunity, but also consulted with their tribal citizens to ensure that they were meeting their tribal citizens' needs. So I've seen this funding uh, used to address housing shortages, improve water and sewer infrastructure, uh, address broadband issues, create programs addressing learning loss during the pandemic, um, it creates social services programs, including cultural preservation and language classes to meet the needs of their people. Um, it's been used to address public safety needs. One of the tribes we recently visited installed solar street lamps because they didn't have street lamps in a particular part on their reservation, and they had pedestrian deaths because it was so dark on their reservation. I've seen uh, tribes develop um, food sovereignty programs and food processing uh, plants, as well as you know, you know, greenhouses that have addressed uh, food supply chain disruptions. So uh, this new guidance that will be covered today is in response to tribal leader feedback from the consultation that we heard held in November. And I thank the Office of Tribal and Native Affairs and all of my Treasury colleagues on this call today for responding to the feedback that they received from tribal nations and addressing it. And um, so from this important engagement, the new guidance provides clarity on the definition of an obligation, and it gives deference to tribal governments by providing the opportunity to create interagency agreements between departments and tribal enterprises. So I'm now going to turn this over to policy advisor Jen Friesian from the Office of Tribal and Native Affairs, who has worked very hard on all of the recovery programs and is now a policy advisor within our office. So Jen, to, over to you. Thank you, Treasurer Malerba. So this presentation, uh, it's designed to give an overview for tribal governments on the state and local fiscal recovery funds, or the SLFRF, uh, new section 17 
obligations within the frequently asked questions. So this presentation is for educational purposes. It should not be construed as legal advice or a statement of binding policy from Treasury. So Boujou, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Jen Parisian. As uh, Treasurer Malerba mentioned, I'm within the Office of Tribal and Native Affairs. And I'm a tribal citizen from the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians. So as the lead for tribal consultation uh, and tribal and native listing sessions, the Office of Tribal and Native Affairs leads implementation of Treasury Order 112-04 on tribal consultation and coordination with tribal nation policy that was adopted in 2023. So before we get started with an overview of the new FAQs, I would like to thank you for your engagement in the tribal consultation that was held in November of 2023 and for sending in your comment letters. The consultation process is critical to bring in and promote tribal voices on challenges impacting your communities. Under the Biden-Harris administration, they have championed equity through the landmark ARPA or American Rescue Plan Act, and the ARPA contained economic recovery programs, including a $20 billion set aside for tribes within the SLFRF. It's to respond to and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. So we understand with this historic relief, it was important to provide clear guidance on obligations to assist tribal governments and other recipients and to weave in elements of President Biden's new executive order 14112 reforming federal funding and support for tribal nations to embrace our trust responsibilities and promote the next era of tribal self-determination. Common themes from the tribal consultation included a desire to cover payroll costs after the obligation deadline of December 31st, 2024, clarity on whether interagency agreements between departments and tribal enterprises counted as an obligation, flexibility to cover contract cost increases, and clarification on program income earned after the obligation deadline. So Treasury released the newly added Section 17 of the FAQs to respond to comment letters and consultation. So that being said, let's get started. I will now turn it over to the Director of the SLFRF Program, Mrs. Veronica Soto. Thank you, Jen. Uh, to all you participating in this webinar, welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Veronica Soto, I go by Vero, and I am the Director of the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds Program. On this slide, you can see our agenda for today's conversation. And that conversation is focused on explaining the information in the new section of the SLFRF Frequently Asked Questions, Section 17, Obligations. The link to the FAQs is in the chat. Today's webinar is intended for all tribal governments, including annual reporters who received $30 million or less in SLFRF funds. As a reminder, all SLFRF funds must be obligated by December 31st, 2024. Tribes will be required to return to Treasury any SLFRF funds if they have not been obligated by that deadline. As Treasurer Malerba and Jen Parisian mentioned, in response to tribal governments and other recipient questions about the definition of obligation and requests for clarifications about how to meet the December 31st, 2024 obligation deadline, in November of 2023, Treasury issued an interim final rule, we call it the obligation IFR, to amend the definition of obligation and provide additional clarifications for state and local fiscal recovery funds programs, the SLFRF that was established under the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Among other items, these FAQs contain three important clarifications. First, Treasury considers an interagency agreement to constitute an obligation for purposes of the SLFRF rule if the agreement satisfies certain conditions. Second, Treasury considers a recipient to have incurred an obligation with respect to personnel cost for an employee through December 31, 2026, to the extent the employee is serving in a position that was established and filled 
prior to December 31, 2024. Third, Treasury is clarifying how recipients may cover cost increases associated with contracts or subawards entered into by December 31, 2024. In addition, Treasury has also extended the deadline to report the estimate of costs to meet certain legal and administrative requirements. This deadline was originally referenced in the obligation IFR and the accompanying webinars about it last November. This new deadline is as follows. If your tribe received more than 30 million and you report quarterly, then the report due July 31st, 2024 will be your first opportunity to report these estimates to Treasury. If your tribe received less than 30 million and you report annually, then you will report these numbers in the report due April 30th of 2025. We also clarify that this estimate is not mandatory, but later in the presentation, we'll talk through the circumstances in which you may want to submit such estimates. These FAQs are the most up-to-date source of explanatory information about the SLFRF obligation requirements, and Treasury is not issuing a final rule for the obligation IFR. These FAQs clarify the guidance in the obligation IFR and are what you should refer to in order to understand how to meet the obligation deadline of December 31, 2024. Again, there will not be a separate new final rule. To the extent the FAQs differ from previous explanations of the obligation requirement, either in the obligation IFR or in recipient webinars, you should rely on the FAQs. Finally, there have been no changes to either the obligation deadline or the expenditure deadlines. So we'll move to the next slide. So this slide should look familiar to those of you who have joined or watched previous webinars because it's the same slide we have used in the past. The reason it's the same is because the obligation and expenditure deadlines remain the same. For all seven eligible uses, including the provision of government services for funds claimed under revenue loss, recipients must obligate SLFRF funds by December 31st, 2024. Recipients must expend SLFRF funds obligated for all eligible uses except surface transportation projects and Title I projects by December 31st, 2026. Recipients must expend SLFRF funds obligated for surface transportation projects and Title I projects by September 30th, of 2026. With that table setting, we will now move into a discussion of the new FAQs. As a reminder, these FAQs are section 17 of the SLFRF FAQs. The link has been dropped into the chat. And one more piece of context to keep in mind as we move through today's presentation. This presentation is intended to provide an overview of the content of the new FAQs and explain in plain language what the new FAQs say. We know there are going to be many questions about how you report some things as obligated um, given the new FAQs. Lots of how-to questions so far. We plan to provide additional guidance and information ahead of the July reporting deadline for quarterly reporters that provides a more practical how-to explanation of how to report the obligations. But this presentation will not get into that today. Today's presentation is intended to explain the content of the new FAQs. And with that final piece of background from me, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Liz Hippo, to provide an overview of the definition of obligation. Liz? Thanks so much, Vero. So we are now gonna walk you through what can constitute an obligation. Some of these items have always constituted an obligation, such as a contract or a subaward. Some of these items have recently been clarified as counting as an obligation in the obligation IFR and new FAQs. 
An obligation continues to mean an order placed for property and services and entry into contracts, subawards, and similar transactions that require payment. This definition has not changed since the program launched in 2021. In addition, the obligation IFR clarified that an obligation also means a requirement under federal law or regulation or a provision of the SLFRF award terms and conditions to which the recipient becomes subject as a result of receiving or expending SLFRF funds. Or more simply put, when recipients incur costs related to certain legal and administrative requirements of the SLFRF award funds. This was the focus of our obligation IFR webinar and consultation in November. We have clarified in these new FAQs that similar transactions that require a payment include interagency agreements if they meet the conditions laid out in FAQ 17.6, which is discussed further in FAQ 17.23 for tribes. It can also include expenses for recipient employees if they meet the conditions laid out in FAQ 17.7. Next slide, please. The key takeaway from this slide is that there are several pathways via which an obligation can be occurred. They are an order placed for property or services, a contract, a subaward, similar transactions that require payment, which may include certain interagency agreements, including MOUs, see FAQ 17.6 and 17.23. Also, under certain circumstances, payroll expenses for recipients' employees, see FAQ 17.7. And as a reminder, an obligation is also a requirement under federal law or regulation or provision of the SLFRF award terms and conditions to which the recipient becomes subject as a result of receiving or expending SLFRF funds. Next slide, please. Now, let's talk about what an obligation is not. An obligation is not a tribal resolution, adopted budget, or budget amendment. An obligation is not an appropriation of SLFRF funds. An obligation is not an executive order. It is not a written or oral intention to enter into a contract. It is not a grant of legal authority to enter into a contract. It is not simply claiming funds under the revenue loss category, and it is also not just moving SLFRF funds to a general fund as revenue loss, but not further establishing an obligation with those funds by December 31st, 2024. This includes recipients who are utilizing the $10 million standard allowance. Any recipient using the revenue loss eligible use category must meet the obligation deadline and enter expenditure information as a project in their performance and expenditure report. Well, we're gonna explain these last couple of bullet points about obligating revenue loss funds in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. But for now, let's turn to an example that will help illustrate what is or is not an obligation. Here's a case study. Are budgets or a resolution an obligation? Case example. A tribal council passed an SLFRF project plan budget via resolution, which outlines exactly how SLFRF funds are to be used. The question is, has the tribe obligated its SLFRF funds? The answer is no. A resolution, budget, and or appropriation authority for SLFRF funds is not considered an obligation. The tribe will need to obligate its funds through at least one of the mechanisms outlined below, which is also the mechanism that we discussed on slide nine, in order to meet the obligation deadline. Next slide, please. This slide is another one that will look familiar to those of you who have joined us in the past for other webinars, or specifically the obligation IFR tribal consultation. This slide is simply repeating what we explained then. The obligation deadline applies only to the recipient of SLFRF funds, which is you, the tribe. It does not apply to your subrecipients. If you have entered into a subaward with a subrecipient, then you have obligated those funds and you do not, they do not need to take additional action to meet the obligation deadline. Next slide, please. So as I said, we were gonna talk a little bit more about uh, revenue loss and obligating funds under revenue loss. So it's very important clarification 
because we received a lot of questions about this issue in response to the obligation IFR. Obligation IFR. So to underscore, revenue loss funds must be obligated via one of the same mechanisms as any other eligible use of SLF or F funds. FAQ 17.15 explains this. This means that projects entered as an expenditure category 6.1 project must meet the same standards of obligation as any other eligible use category of SLF or F, i.e. those funds must be obligated via a contract or an interagency agreement or one of the other mechanisms outlined on slide nine. In addition, I wanna draw your attention to this last bullet point, which explains how a recipient utilizing revenue loss to pay for government services should report the use as a project under expenditure category 6.1. Recipients must enter a project description for any project entered under 6.1. Revenue loss project descriptions must summarize the project in sufficient detail to provide an understanding of the major activities that will occur. Descriptions should establish what the project seeks to accomplish and should include enough information to make clear how the recipient determines project's eligibility. So to underscore the main takeaway from this slide, all SLFRF funds must be obligated by December 31st, 2024, using the definition of obligation, including revenue loss funds. Just reporting to Treasury that you have claimed revenue loss funds does not mean that they are automatically obligated. With that, I will turn it over to my colleague Joel, who will walk through a couple of the new clarifications in the FAQs about ways to obligate funds. Thanks, Liz. Now we want to talk about how tribes can use SLFRF funds to pay personnel who are direct employees of the tribe. During the tribal consultation, Tribes gave examples where tribal employees were needed to complete necessary recovery programs, such as elder nutrition programs or overseeing housing projects. In responding to the consultation and implementing Executive Order 14.11.2, Treasury has clarified flexibilities that will enable recipients to keep paying those direct employees until the expenditure deadline. In our new FAQs, we've clarified that a tribe can use SLFRF funds to cover personnel costs for an employee through December 31, 2026. Next slide, please. The employee must be serving in a position that was established and filled prior to December 31st, 2024. As with all other expenses, the personnel costs must be expended in connection with an eligible use of SLFRF funds. The key thing to remember is that the obligation relates to the position, not the individual person. We understand that staffing changes occur. As long as the position was created by the end of 2024 and someone was serving in that position by the end of 2024, the recipient may continue to use funds to cover costs for employees serving in that position through the end of 2026. Eligible expenses include all salaries and wages, covered benefits, and payroll taxes. So as I've just noted, this provision for payroll expenses relates to the position, not an individual employee. A tribe may replace an employee in that position if the position was established and filled by December 31, 2024, and the replacement does not need to be immediate. Tribes may also reorganize positions within the scope of an eligible project after December 31, 2024. For example, if an eligible project employs 10 job training specialists on December 31, 2024, it's permissible for the recipient to use funds to cover payroll for one of those training specialists who is then promoted to be a supervisor as long as there are no more than 10 positions covered through SLFRF funds in total. So while this provision allows tribes to continue paying personnel costs for existing positions, recipients may not use SLFRF funds to cover expenses for any new positions created after the obligation deadline. Now let's look at how this might work in practice. Suppose a tribe submits a report to Treasury estimating $100,000 in SLFRF payroll costs in 2025 and 2026. That estimate ensures that those funds are treated as obligated and can be used for the intended purpose. And I'll discuss estimates in more detail in a moment. So in this scenario, in 2025, due to increases in the cost of living, the tribal council feels it is necessary to increase wages to retain employees. So here, staff costs have unexpectedly increased. 
the tribe would like to allocate an additional $50,000 in SLFRF funds for payroll costs. The question is whether the tribe can increase its estimated payroll expenses to the amount needed to pay those employees. And the answer here is yes. Eligible personnel costs are determined by the amount of those costs at the time of the payment to the employees, not those costs at the time of the estimate. A tribe may raise the salaries of the employees in positions created and filled by December 31, 2024. However, as I said, they may not create new positions after that date. Treasury will update the compliance and reporting guidance with additional information about how to report the estimate for these funds and how to report how these funds are ultimately expended. Now let's look at the reverse scenario. Suppose a tribe submits a report to Treasury estimating $200,000 in SLFRF payroll costs in 2025 and 2026 to fund positions to oversee the construction of a food distribution center. However, Due to the completion of the project construction ahead of schedule, only $150,000 is needed for payroll expenses in those years. So what can the tribe do with the unexpended $50,000 attributable to the estimate? Those funds are still usable. There's no penalty for the initial estimate being incorrect. The tribe may then expend the $50,000 on another eligible use of SLFRF funds. The project must meet all of the requirements of SLFRF including the requirement that the recipient incur an obligation for that project by December 31, 2024. Okay, we just talked a bit about estimates in the context of payroll expenses in 2025 and 2026. Now I wanna explain a bit more about estimates in general, what they do, and why a tribe might want to submit one or more estimates. There are three separate kinds of estimates of future expenses in the SLFRF program. First, as we've discussed, a tribe can submit estimates for payroll costs to be expended in 2025 and 2026. Second, a tribe can submit estimates for certain administrative and legal expenses. And third, a tribe can submit estimates for potential costs to cover contract change orders and contingencies in cases where a contract provides for those change orders or contingencies. I wanna emphasize here that these estimates are not mandatory. The reason a tribe would submit these estimates to Treasury is to ensure that the tribe can retain and expend funds that they've already obligated for an eligible use and do not have to return those funds to Treasury as unobligated. This is only relevant in cases where a tribe hasn't reported those expenses through another project in the reporting quote. Because there hasn't been another report, we at Treasury would not be aware that those funds have already been obligated. So submitting the estimate ensures that the recipient will be permitted to spend SLFRF funds on the relevant expenses in 2025 and 2026. So to sum up, the estimate itself is not an obligation. The estimate is one way to communicate to Treasury that you've already obligated funds for a particular purpose. So we've already discussed the payroll expenses for which a recipient might want to submit an estimate. I want to briefly touch on the administrative and legal expenses for which it might make sense to submit an estimate as well. And I'll note that this provision is not new. The obligation IFR clarified that these administrative and legal expenses are considered obligations. We discussed this in case study number one in the tribal consultation on the obligation IFR back in November. I'm just reiterating the flexibilities we discussed at that date. There are some costs for which SLFRF funds are already considered obligated because they relate to requirements of federal laws and regulations. The recipient became subject to those requirements as a result of receiving SLFRF funds and thus has an obligation to spend funds to meet them. For example, a tribe may need to comply with certain cultural monitoring requirements at a construction site due to NAGPRA or pay for rights of way. If those costs are not reported as obligated through another project, tribes can submit to Treasury an estimate of those anticipated costs to ensure that the funds can be used for those purposes. That includes costs for expenses in 2025, 2026, and for award closeout. The estimate isn't the only way to spend funds on these costs. For example, a tribe could create an interagency agreement or contract for such expenses and then report that agreement or contract to Treasury. But the estimate is another available option to you. Okay, let's zoom back out to estimates in general. This slide summarizes the options available for estimates of both personnel costs and certain administrative and legal costs that I just discussed. 
As I mentioned earlier, these estimates aren't mandatory. They're available if a tribe hasn't reported the relevant obligated funds in another manner to ensure that those funds remain available after the obligation deadline and aren't returned to Treasury. These estimates have different deadlines, as described on the slide. For personnel costs, estimates are due by January 31, 2025 for quarterly reporters, that is, for tribes that received an SLFRF award of more than $30 million. And those estimates are due on April 30th, 2025 for annual reporters, that is, those tribes that received less than $30 million in SLFRF funds. For administrative and legal costs, there are different deadlines. Estimates are due by July 31, 2024 for quarterly reporters and April 30th, 2025 for annual reporters. Note that this is an extension from the deadline in the obligation IFR. Treasury updated this reporting deadline to give recipients additional time. Below, this slide has a little bit of information about how these estimates work. You can refer to the FAQs listed for more information. At the bottom, you'll also see the FAQ with more information on the estimate for costs related to contract change orders and contingencies in the event that you're obligating funds for those purposes. We're going to discuss these reporting questions in greater depth in a future webinar, so I'm not going to go into further detail here, but I encourage you to take a look at these FAQs and stay tuned for more information. Now let's sum up with a case study. A tribe plans to hire an auditor to conduct a single audit that will include SLFRF funds. The single audit will be conducted in 2025 and the tribe has not yet selected an auditor, so there's no contract. The question is, can SLFRF funds pay for costs to conduct that single audit? And the answer here is yes. Single audit costs are one of the eligible administrative and legal expenses listed on the earlier slide. They're considered obligated as a result of the recipient receiving SLFRF funds. A tribe can submit an estimate to Treasury of their expected costs related to that single audit to ensure that the funds are treated as obligated. And to reiterate, the estimate isn't a requirement. It just ensures that the recipient doesn't have to return the funds to Treasury in the event those costs aren't reported through another item in your project and expenditure report. With that, I'll turn it back over to my colleague, Jen Parisian. Thanks, Joel. Uh, next, let's talk about another clarification made uh, by the FAQs, the treatment of interagency agreements. So this clarification request came from the comments made by tribal leaders on the unique financial management structures of tribal governments. Next slide, please. Thank you. In FAQ 17.6 and 17.23, Treasury clarified that interagency agreements within a tribal government that meet certain conditions qualify as transactions requiring payment and are thus sufficient to meet the obligation requirement. If you finalize an interagency agreement by the obligation deadline at the end of 2024, you can use that interagency agreement to obligate funds that a government agency will then expend in 2025 and in 2026. A memoranda of agreement and a memoranda, memoranda of understanding can count as interagency agreements. Any agreement must meet the requirements summarized on this slide and further detailed in FAQ 17.6 and 17.23. So let's look practically at how this might work in a tribe. Suppose that the Tribal Council has made SLFRF available to the Social Services Department to cover the operational costs of an elder care program through December 31st, 2026. The Tribal Council has entered into an agreement with the Social Services Department, under which the Social Services Department agrees to perform and complete in a satisfactory and proper manner the scope of work uh, specified in accordance with SLFRF award terms and conditions. So the question is, uh, does this count as an interagency agreement between the tribe and the social services department? This interagency agreement um, or MOU uh, counts as an obligation if it meets the conditions summarized on the previous slide. So an interagency agreement or MOU can govern the provision of funds from one agency, department, or other part of tri tribal government to another. Uh, that established an obligation, which can then be reported to Treasury to meet the obligation requirement. Next slide, thank you. 
In the newly added Section 17 of the FAQs, Treasury also clarified that for purposes of the SLFRF program, Treasury considers an interagency agreement between a tribe's unit of government, that includes the tribal council, departments, agencies, or other instrumentalities of a tribe to constitute an obligation if it meets the conditions set forth in FAQ 17.6. So unit of government could include a department, an agency, a housing authority, or other in instrumentality of the tribe, an enterprise organized under tribal law, if the tribe treats the enterprise as a unit, department, agency, or other instrumentality of the tribe, it can also include a corporation formed under Section 17 of the Indian Reorganization Act or Section 3 Corporation of the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. These units within a tribal government would be considered a unit, a department, an agency, or other instrumentality of the tribe for purposes of this FAQ. So in addition to clarifying that tribal governments can obligate to a unit of government within the tribe, including enterprises, Treasury is clarifying that for purposes of SLFRF, federal procurement requirements do not apply to interagency agreements between units of the tribal government. For example, if a tribe desires to create an eligible interagency agreement or MOU between the tribe and an enterprise, that meets the definition of a unit of government to carry out a broadband project, it does not need to put the project out for bid. Please note that procurement provisions under the uniform guidance must be followed with outside vendors. You must still follow 2 CFR Part 200 for outside contracts and other procurement transactions. So let's look at uh, another case study example. The tribe is building low income housing to address housing shortages on the reservation. The tribe has a tribally chartered construction company that can both carry out the project and create jobs for tribal citizens. The tribal council has entered into an agreement with the construction company to perform and complete in a satisfactory manner, uh, proper manner, the scope of work specified in accordance with the SLFRF award terms and conditions. Does this constitute an obligation? Yes. If the interagency agreement meets the conditions outlined in FAQ 17.6 and the company qualifies as a unit of government of the tribe, as described in FAQ 17.23, uh, it does. So with that, uh, I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Eric. Hi, everyone. My name is Eric Roche, and I serve as a policy advisor for the SLFRF program. With the obligation deadline fast approaching, we know that many of you are working hard to get contracts and legal agreements in place for work that is going to take place in 2025 and 2026. We also know that tribes and other recipients need flexibility to handle unforeseen situations that may arise in 2025 and 2026, such as a vendor going out of business, or an unanticipated cost emerging on an underway project. Next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so let's discuss the flexibilities that exist for contracts after the obligation deadline has passed. First, if your contract or subaward includes a mechanism for cost adjustments, such as a process for submitting and approving change orders or a contingency provision, then you may use SLFRF funds to pay for the cost adjustment. I'm aware that change orders may be called different things in different tribes. When I talk about circumstances that might create the need for a change order, I mean the typical costs that come up as a project is being designed, built, and delivered. For example, perhaps the type of equipment spec for a building turns out to be insufficient and a more expensive version is needed. Or, if once construction was started, unforeseen site conditions are discovered that require additional funds to remedy. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but in these situations, the tribe may want to use a change order to cover the additional cost. If the contract provides for change orders or contingencies that cover the situation, then those costs are considered obligated and SLFRF funds may be used for them after the obligation deadline. Next. I want to address a frequent question. Can we go back one slide? 
Let's stay right there for a sec. Next, I want to address a frequent question we hear. Will my tribe be able to amend a contract after the obligation deadline has passed? The answer is yes, so long as the scope and purpose of the amended contract are substantially the same as they were in the original contract. In other words, you shouldn't modify a small contract for replacing a few sidewalks into constructing a four lane highway. To be clear, Treasury is aware that some amended contracts may have a higher cost. So long as the amended contract has substantially the same scope and purpose, you may use SLFRF funds to pay for the increased cost of the amended contract after the obligation deadline has passed. Finally, as discussed in the preamble in the obligation IFR, there are situations where you may need to completely replace an existing contract. A contractor sub-award can be replaced first when the tribe terminates the contract or sub-award because the business defaults, closes, or cannot perform work, or the tribe and contractor or sub-recipient mutually agree to terminate the contract or sub-award for convenience, or the tribe terminates the contract or sub-award for convenience if it was not properly awarded. If you use this option, please know that there need to be clear evidence that the contract or sub award was improper and the original contract or sub award was entered into by the recipient in good faith. The recipient should document their determination that it was not properly awarded. I also want to mention the source of funds tribes may use to cover the cost of to cover the cost of changes in contracts and sub awards. Tribes may reclassify funds from one of their SLFRF projects is, sorry, tribes may reclassify funds from another of their SLFRF projects as needed. For example, if you have a project that is finishing under budget, you may reclassify the savings from that project to another project that may be going over budget or needs the funding. Tribes will also have the opportunity to submit an estimated obligation to cover change orders or contingencies through the expenditure period. Tribes providing such an estimate will not be required to return such funds to Treasury after 2024, assuming that they are ultimately expended for an eligible purpose. Additional information on submitting estimates will be provided in future webinars and reporting guidance. And of course, you can also utilize non-SLFRF sources such as your general fund to pay for modifications to contracts or subawards. If you'd like to know more, FAQ 17.16 through 17.19 contained additional information. Let's look at a quick example here. Here, a tribe is using $1 million in SLFRF funds to build broadband in 2025 and 2026. However, in 2025, the tribe discovers that the project needs to be updated via change order, and the total cost is now 1.5 million. What do you all think? Can the tribe use their SLFRF funds to cover the cost of the change order? The answer is that change orders or other type of modifications are allowed if they were contemplated in the original contract. In this case, the tribe's contract included standard change order processes and language, and thus they may use SLFRF funds for the increased cost. Before the obligation deadline arrives, you may want to review your contracts and subawards to see if they speak to the possibility of cost modifications like change orders. FAQ 17.16 contains additional information about this type of situation. I've got one more example for you, everyone here. Let's say that a tribe has awarded a contract for a surface transportation project, but in March 2025, the contractor ceases business unexpectedly and the project is only 50% complete. The tribe cannot leave the road unfinished and wants to enter into a new contract with a different contractor to complete the project. So the question is, can the tribe enter into a contract after the obligation deadline with a new contractor so they can complete this project? The answer is yes, so long as the new contract is within substantially the same scope and purpose as the original contract. I also quickly want to go through two other clarifications in the newly added Section 17 of the FAQs that are important to tribal governments. <clears throat> First, indirect costs are addressed in FAQ 
recipients may continue to charge their current negotiated indirect cost rate agreements with their federal cognizant agency or the de minimis rate of 10% of modified total direct costs pursuant to 200.414 after December 31st, 2024 through December 31st, 2026. On program income, this is covered by FAQ 17.21. This fact Q clarifies four ways tribal governments may use program income after December 31st, 2024 in years 2025 and 2026. The tribe can, one, cover the cost of eligible uses of SLFRF for which the tribe incurs an obligation by December 31st, 2024. Two, pay for permissible upward cost adjustments in contracts or subawards, including replacement contracts and subawards. Three, cover expenses necessary to meet le certain legal and administrative requirements. And four, cover personnel costs obligated by December 31st, 2024. And with that, I'm going to hand the presentation off to my colleagues, Mira and James. We're going to walk through some question and answers.